Um, and I think, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Michelle Saka. Michelle Saka is going to talk about in more detail about asset management planning and approaches through a green infrastructure lens. Michelle is a senior research scientist for the Tor Toronto Region Conservation Authority. And so in this role, she supports regions, uh, municipalities, and Green Infrastructure Ontario Coalition in their green infrastructure and urban forest initiatives. With that, I'll hand this over to Michelle. Perfect, thanks so much, Chris. So can you see my, my first slide there? And can you see, um, can you hear me? <laughs> yes to both. Perfect. All right, good morning, everyone. So I'm going to start off today with an introduction to asset management planning and approaches through a green infrastructure lens. So to start off, we're gonna talk a little bit about the definition of green infrastructure. And this is because two people can really be having a conversation about it and be referring to two very different things. So I want to make sure that we're sort of all on the same page. And here in Ontario, we have an official definition of green infrastructure in our provincial policy statement. So that is that green infrastructure is natural and human made elements that provide ecological and hydrological benefits. So it can include components such as natural heritage features and systems, parklands, stormwater management systems, urban forests, permeable surfaces and green roofs. So this definition is a direct result of GEO's advocacy work in the early 2010s. So as we've heard a bit today, so all green infrastructure assets provide a range of municipal services. So Jill Ann is gonna provide sort of more details on the specifics related to trees. But in general, here are some of the services that green infrastructure provides. So they provide stormwater services related to both runoff reduction and also improving water quality. Green infrastructure can help reduce urban heat by providing shade and cooling the air. It's also a fairly unique tool. So we've talked a lot about climate change already today, but it contributes to both climate change mitigation. So sequestering carbon and wood biomass and adaptation. So reducing flooding, heat reduction, improved air quality. And you know, it's, it's one of the, the few approaches that really impacts and helps with both of these areas. I also wanted to take a minute to point out that one of the significant benefits of green infrastructure is that it does not provide just one service. So with gray infrastructure, a pipe, for example, its purpose is to convey water and that's it. You know, it has one function and it provides one, maybe a couple services. Green infrastructure generally has multiple functions and, and therefore it can provide many services. You, you might build it to reduce your stormwater runoff but it's also cooling the air, you know, improving air quality, sequestering carbon, all while contributing to increased biodiversity and healthier communities. So now I'm gonna do a very quick introduction to asset management planning. And this is really focused for those of you who are from more of the environmental side of things. I know this will be very basic for the asset managers on the line. But asset management planning, it aims to manage municipal assets over the entire life cycle to ensure that they deliver the required services. So it's also a process that manages risks and aims to do all of this at the minimum cost. So in essence, asset management planning, it's a process to evaluate and communicate trade-offs between services, costs, and risks. So when it comes to green infrastructure, there are quite a few reasons we want to make sure that these assets are included in corporate asset management planning processes. So we really want to ensure that green infrastructure assets are valued and considered in decision making parallel to their gray infrastructure counterparts, things like roads, pipes, traffic lights, etc. We want to demonstrate accountability and undertake responsible management of green infrastructure assets. So this includes understanding priorities, the risks, the costs, and the management options associated with them. Asset management planning can also help support strategic management to increase investment in green infrastructure in a municipality. 
Asset management planning can help you develop, support, and defend budgets for green infrastructure. And then finally, you know, including green infrastructure in asset management plans can help make green infrastructure eligible for provincial and federal infrastructure funding. So that's because these funding streams can often be tied to having an asset management plan associated with the asset you're applying for. So if you want an asset to be able to tick that box in the application process, it's really helpful to include them as part of the plan. Okay, so next I thought it would help to talk through some green infrastructure asset examples. And so I've organized these based on how the Green Infrastructure Ontario Coalition breaks green infrastructure down into different types, because I think it is useful to get an understanding of the total breadth of everything we're talking about and considering here. So first we have the urban tree canopy or urban forest. And this is really the backbone of our green infrastructure system. So it includes the street trees, the backyard trees and the trees in our forests and parks. And we're gonna talk about forests, urban forests a lot today. Our green infrastructure network then extends into, you know, natural heritage and parks and open space systems. So here again, we have our forests, but we also have wetlands, meadows, as well as our parks. And parks includes everything from large parks to teeny little parkettes on the corners. So next we add in our stormwater systems, or these are sometimes referred to, especially in Ontario, as low impact developments. So they include things like bioswales or infiltration trenches or naturalized stormwater ponds. And then we have our green infrastructure on buildings. So green roofs and green walls. And then we also add in urban agriculture. So this is the green infrastructure that is our community gardens or in this picture with the, with the red on it, we have a green roof agriculture project. So it combines two different types of green infrastructure. So now I did wanna mention that we also include technologies that replicate or support the functions of ecosystems as green infrastructure. So these are things like permeable pavements or rain barrels. And then finally, we consider soil as green infrastructure. And this is because soil is critical to sustaining vegetation. And it also helps manage our water cycles. So without healthy soil, we cannot have healthy trees and other green infrastructure. So when we're talking about green infrastructure in asset management planning, it is helpful to think through who should be involved from a municipal perspective. And in terms of structure, it's really not that different from traditional asset management. It requires building a culture of collaboration within the municipality and really making sure that the individuals that manage or who have knowledge about green infrastructure assets are included at the table. So who this might be will likely depend on the size of your municipality. Larger ones, you might have urban forest staff who should be included. Smaller ones, you, you know, you might have somebody in public works or maybe transportation who manages the trees, or you might have a planner who plans natural heritage areas. The, the key point is, like all asset management, it's important to make sure that the experts in those assets are at the table from the beginning to help you integrate these into your asset management plan. So I thought it might be helpful to highlight some of the key differences between traditional and green infrastructure assets. You're going to see these sort of reiterated throughout the, um, throughout the workshop today, but I thought it would be useful to give you um, a quick list up front. So first, on a fundamental level, traditional assets are purchased and constructed. Whereas this is true for some green infrastructure assets, it's not true for all of them. So some of them like forests or wetlands can be naturally forming. So they're never purchased. Another main difference is that the vast majority of traditional assets have a very clear end of life and will require full replacement at some point. Some green infrastructure assets, again, forests are a good example here, have, you know, they have no definitive end of life and therefore don't necessarily ever need to be fully replaced. 
Another difference is when you build a traditional asset, your expected levels of service are generally achieved as soon as you know, construction is complete or it's operational. Many green infrastructure assets, you know, they can take months, years, or even decades to achieve their full expected service level. You know, it takes time for a tree to grow. And this also means that your asset appreciates in value instead of depreciating in value, which is very different from most assets. And this actually brings me to my last point, where traditional assets have something called generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP. Natural assets at the moment, they do not. So we have had to develop these methods for valuing these assets based on accounting principles and we'll provide you more details on those methods uh, later today. So while there are, you know, while there are differences between green and traditional infrastructure assets, there are strategies and approaches for addressing those differences. And we have seen municipalities in Ontario successfully integrate green infrastructure into their corporate asset management planning. And in the process, we have really developed a lot of global leaders here in this area. At least four municipalities have integrated at least one green infrastructure asset type fully into their asset management plan. So the town of Ajax has their boulevard trees under forestry. The city of London, which we'll see in a lot more detail today, have their forest trees and stormwater assets in their plan. York Region and Richmond Hill, they both have street trees and forests included in their asset management plans. So as you'll see in more detail today from the City of London on their approach, you'll recognize that they've had to address a lot of the differences I talked about, I talked about in the last slide, and you'll see that it is possible to do so. Okay, so over the course of the workshop today, we're gonna to talk a fair bit about asset value and levels of service. And I wanted to spend a couple minutes here setting the context around asset value, because I think there can sometimes be some confusion, especially when it comes to the valuation of natural assets. First, I thought we could look at how asset value is used in asset management planning. So first, it informs long-term asset management decisions and it can inform financial decisions. It's used for reporting, so both internal and external reporting. And then finally, it allows for comparisons between service areas or asset categories. So it essentially acts as an indicator showing how much investment a municipality has in each asset area. This last point is really important because this is why we need to make sure that green infrastructure uses the same method for calculating value as its traditional infrastructure counterparts. So this graphic on this slide shows an example from Ajax. So here we have a graph that compares the asset values of all their assets. You can see that they're most significantly invested in road assets at the top in red there, which makes sense. But fifth from the top, we can see that they have their boulevard trees reported. So we can learn from this graph that they also have a significant amount invested in this green infrastructure asset type, and therefore they need to make sure that they manage this asset type appropriately. Now, one of the two key areas that often causes some confusion when it comes to valuation is related to PSAB 3150. So this refers to the Public Sector Accounting Board Handbook, Section 3150 on Tangible Capital Assets, or TCAs. This is the standard for calculating value for municipal financial statements. It's the law, and account, all the accountants on the line will know that you must follow it for your financial statements. What it does, if you're not familiar, is it provides guidance on calculating asset value that determines your TCAs. And, and TCAs, they can be really helpful as a starting point for many traditional asset valuations, but it can cause some confusion when it comes to green infrastructure assets. And that's because PSAB currently restricts the inclusion of inherited natural resources in financial statements. So this means that many natural assets like forests or wetlands cannot be considered TCAs and therefore cannot be included in financial statements at the moment. 
So this is a really important thing to note because assets that are included in asset management plans do not need to be TCAs. In fact, your asset management plan should not only include TCAs. It should include any asset that has a role in service delivery that requires deliberate management. Okay, so the second area that causes some confusion, this is more for the environmental folks on the call, and it's around ecosystem service valuations. So these are ecological economic valuations of the services provided by different green infrastructure assets. So it's really important to note here that these are economic valuations and they are not accounting valuations. Those might seem interchangeable, but they are two very, very different things. So initially, it could seem like valuing the ecological services of green infrastructure assets would be beneficial because it would potentially produce a higher valuation. But this is actually not the case in asset management planning. To be credible, and to be defensible, we need to ensure we're comparing apples to apples when it comes to green and gray infrastructure. So gray infrastructure assets use current replacement costs to value their assets, and they do not consider flood damage avoided from stormwater pipes or accidents avoided from traffic lights. You know, they focus on the cost of replacing the asset itself and therefore so should green infrastructure in the context of asset management planning. So what this means is that focusing on the cost associated with replacing the biophysical structure of green infrastructure assets and not the services they provide. So ecosystem service valuations are really important for building the business case for green infrastructure or for communications with the public or with council. You know, they are just not the evaluation method that should be used within the asset management planning process specifically. And we'll talk a lot more about the evaluation method that you can use later today at the end of this workshop. All right, so at that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Chris 